Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is George, and I work for Gazelli Art House. Uh, and um, for each show, we try and um, do some sort of educational event for each show that's not necessarily an artist talking about their own work, but it might be a theme or subject that is kind of brought up in the show or something re related to the, sh to the show uh, that's on. And um, today we are going to be talking about and hopefully maybe redefining what we mean by the term interdisciplinary practice. And we're going to sort of discuss and have a little think about what the boundaries of, I guess, art uh, can be or is. Uh, and uh, yeah, so my name's George, and we're joined uh, by Charlotte Colbert. Charlotte is a photographer and also a scriptwriter. And Charlotte's done a couple of shows at Gazelli already. The first one was in December 2013. Um, ben Tricklebank is an award winning, winning uh, film director. And Ben and Aaron Coblin co collaborated to make these works that you can see um, behind you. Charlotte's works are upstairs, uh, by the way, if you, so if you get a chance to have a look at those, they're the black and white photographs. Uh, we've got uh, Leanne Wiersba, uh, who is a curator at the uh, V&A Museum, uh, with a particular interest in fashion, kind of. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Fatosh Ustek, who is um, currently, it's an independent curator, but currently working on this big project called Fig2 which is curating 50 shows in 50 weeks, and that's gonna be on at the ICA um, studio um, next year. Yes. Um, so I think like, what would we be good to um, talk about? The, the reason why we're kind of talking about this interdisciplinary um, thing is that so several of the artists that are in this exhibition um, kind of have practices that extend outside of the boundary of like contemporary art, if you like. So Leah, um, uh, uh, yeah, so, so some of the artists are kind of more well known for doing other things other than being purely uh, artists, I guess. But that's what we're going to try and figure out, what those boundaries are, if they're important as well. I mean, it, you know, is it important for us to um, have a sort of boundary around what art is supposed to be? Um, and I think maybe what we could talk about, first of all, is, how, is sort of maybe redefining a bit more clearly what we mean by interdisciplinary and if that's the correct word for to use <laughs> uh, so Fatosh I believe we you were talking about this if we were debating about it upstairs and yeah. my proposal is actually interdisciplinarity or a kind the term mm. itself suf, uh, suf, suf, um, necessitates two or more than two disciplines to come together in order to produce another discipline so the emergence of more than one discipline that leads to a production of another discipline. Whereas when we talk about interdisciplinarity in visual arts, we are mostly referring to actually a cross-disciplinary approach or a transdisciplinarity where the artist, let's say, sources their uh, information or body of knowledge from different uh, disciplines. Let it be from science or it could be from literature that is brought into the domain of art. So I would rather suggest, and maybe it is a very bold start when we announce the talk about that it being interdisciplinary to say, sorry, but this term is actually a fallacy or it is an impossibility. Or it's actually, if it would be only possible when we can talk about something else than what we call art or humanities or science. So you think that like a transdisciplinary practice would exist outside of uh, a contemporary art interdisciplinary of practice would exist outside of sure. all the disciplines okay. that exist. It would add another dimension, another discipline into yeah. the family or set of disciplines that we talk about today. Sure. So, Charlotte. Do I get an no, idea? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, because when I saw <coughs> you sent the thing about the interdisciplinary, I thought it was interesting. But I was wondering um, if there was such a thing as like a unidisciplinary practice and if that was even conceivable sort of outside perhaps of a sort of more laboratory sort of practice because it seems that there's sort of no way to create anything without mixing and sort of getting anything from 
everywhere and that's how I guess you create new thoughts or mm. <laughs> new approaches to things by putting things that wouldn't necessarily have existed together before I guess um, so I don't know I was just um, I think the, the more disciplines <laughs> the, the, the better the more conversations that are created the more bridges mm. um, the more bringing in from outside whether it be literature or, or, or fashion like as uh, the artist upstairs who did that room or, um, or film or I don't know it just seems that it enriches the practice and, and very much creates newness so, so do you sort of feel like anything goes well I think since pop art basically anything goes like or even like I mean that's everything now has sort of been done <laughs> in, a, in a way it will taken out of context like whether it be from the world of advertising or the world of fashion or the world of performance or the world of dance or uh, it's it's sort of like um, been exploded kind of like I guess since Duchamp put a urinal <laughs> and said this is actually something mm. to think about in a different way um, if we put it in a different context we can redefine it perhaps yeah <laughs> um, I mean this yeah I mean uh, I don't know Leanne let's let's hear your uh, view on this uh, point well I guess the first question one could ask is the use value of a term like interdisciplinary and I was thinking about it um, because I think it, like naturally we all work in an interdisciplinary way. We all draw from our experiences and the knowledge that we have access to and as well as the materials we have access to. Mm. Um, but I was thinking kind of in relation to discipline and I think discipline is a really interesting word. And I think that it's something that's kind of created, defined and enforced by institutions. And this could include, you know, the institution of the self is so much as we are kind of culturally formed and um, kind of formed in relation to society. And I think discipline has a lot of positive attributes. It kind of uh, denotes a kind of attenuated focus on something, um, a kind of a work, and um, a kind of caring. Um, but it also uh, represents sort of a limitation and control. And I think this is something that art in the 20th and 21st century has really been kind of actively trying to um, work against, is that control and that kind of institutionalization in so, in to mm. some to some extent and you know it's that sort of reliance on the institution but also the kind of wanting to break free of the institution um, but I come from more of a design background um, and I found you know, I've always been interdisciplinary and always working in between disciplines and always trying to kind of define those limits or redefine the limits and push a little bit against them and I think that's where the most interesting dialogues occur and the most interesting ideas and um, the most possibility for innovation. So Ben, you're, mm -hmm. you and Aaron um, collaborated together yeah. for this project. That we're sort of um, we're, we're we're displaying this work in an art gallery. Have you? Do you consider what you do outside of this to be mm -hmm. read as art? I think that's for somebody else to decide. To okay. be honest, I mean, it, it, I find it quite hard to put those kind of boundaries around what I do because. I don't, we don't go into that creation process thinking that what we're trying to create or thinking about necessarily where that's going to live. It's more about, okay. and what I really was going to say is for, for me, the, where the idea of interdisciplinary really lives from the point of view of creating the work is that it, it really lies in collaboration. Um, it, you obviously, I think individuals, especially now, tend to work and you draw upon all these different experiences and you like to pull together lots of different um, practices to try and create something new because at the end of the day we're always just looking to try and make something new and uh, I think when that really comes to life is when you bring in two people that have or, or more that have completely different approaches to the work that they do and, and what happens when those those are pushed together mm. and, and, and what's output from that but in terms of your other question about you know defining this as art um, is a broader question really about how how do you put that tag on something how does it mm. defined as that and is it is that important because it seems to be quite important to people to have this kind of definition about what art sort of is I, mean, I think a lot of it lies in the need to try and put a box around something and be able to define it and mm. and, and I find that in every aspect of what I do, it's, it, it comes across all disciplines in a way, mm. is that people need to be able to uh, 
to put a tag on it, to be able to explain it, and, and just being able to tag it as art is one way of defining what it is. I don't know that that necessarily goes far enough in defining what it is, but... Sure, okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, there's also something about history here as well, isn't there? Because if you're a painter, for example, you're, you, or if you're kind of making paintings, you, you become part of this lineage that's sort of going back, like, thousands of years. You're using materials that have been used and, uh, you know, there's, there's a sort of context to, like, what you're doing. So, so maybe what we're talking about is we're creating this new, we're on the boundary of something new that doesn't have a kind of history perhaps i think it's your point about does anything go and at least i think it does i mean at the end of the day that's the way we're going to find new things isn't it uh, is is that yeah. that you break down those boundaries and allow people to explore but also like it's in you we're only really getting like the sort of i guess the remnants of of the of maybe i'm just thinking, i was just thinking of this you know prehistoric um, hand paintings in caves and stuff, which are kind of like these sort of traces that you um, can keep in sort of inscribing yourself in that lineage of, of I guess, trying to leave a trace rather mm. than, I guess, the idea of newness, okay. you know, as something to explore in and of itself. Like, there's also, like, um, there's just also this sort of... Um, this idea of just leaving a trace and making a mark and... and, and, and um, and working within that context, I guess. Mm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, make, that makes a lot of sense. Rather than, yeah, okay. So Rather it's sort than of like, like we, because I mean, I guess the newness and uh, the newness in the terms of like the interdisciplinary practice is is very much just one aspect of it. Like, um, you know, I mean, interdisciplinary practice in art, you could go back to sort of ritualistic sort of dances and paintings and and even like sacrifices. Or I mean, there's loads of stuff that would have been considered very much. Um, you know, interdisciplinary w within the, the context of the art, how it's recorded at the time. If that makes sense? Does it make mm. sense? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, f uh, Fatosh, mm -hmm. audience, you cur you cu you're a curator. Um, and do you, do you sort of consider what your audience, how your audience is going to respond depending on what sort of thing or show you're curating and if you were to say include um, someone whose work practice was outside of like an art context into uh, a show that you're cur curating how do, how do you think the audiences will sort of respond differently to that or do they respond differently to that I mean of course it's um, it is a very significant component to think about the audience when you're building an exhibition. Because when you're building an exhibition, you're actually laying out a, a web of relationships, a relationship of the artist with the work of art, let's say the object of art. It could be ephemeral as well, it could be a performance, you know, so we don't have to all like conceptual. But you also think about the relationship of the work of art with, you know, with the space that of the exhibit, where it will be located, how it will be located, and how the audience will actually encounter or meet the body of the work of art. And of course, on that level, you also think about the space and you also think about the relationships that might emerge while the space is active and open to welcome different m members of audience from different age groups or uh, backgrounds of interest. So audience build, you know, like audience has a very significant um, position in exhibition making. And of course, as a curator, you have to take this into account. And uh, I come from a actually cross-disciplinary background. I studied at mathematics and then I kind of merged cool. myself into the um, home of art or, you know, like domain of visual arts, let's say. I, I operate within the visual arts, but I'm still very much informed from science and, like, of course, like, influenced by literature and writers. 
And uh, with fig two, one of the things I want to kind of like house in the, in the institution of fig two is going to be a transdisciplinary approach where I'm also working with writers and I'm going to be working with dancers or architects or designers in order to explore this idea of what is an exhibition and how can you exhibit a world of ideas to an audience and how do you communicate that? And with the writers, it's going to be an exhibition. It's not going to be, you won't be seeing a book that is pasted on the walls because it's a very dry and very kind of unengaged way of saying something to the world. <coughs> and I feel like the role of the curator is actually making things public, but also it's about thinking about how you make things public. I'll stop here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I want to, I want to, so, so if audiences generally probably just don't care, really, if, if, if like what they're looking at has been made by someone who's never exhibited in a gallery before, they may not like worry about that. Uh, I wonder what if... What do you mean? Like they don't care about what the artist comes from? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so if, they, if they there's they this sort of, if there's this sort of anything goes kind of... Um, like ideology almost mm -hmm. that there's we're, we're, we're getting rid of this boundary and it's about the experience of sort of being um in this exhibition and looking at it and thinking about what's the curation or, or what the curatorial themes are rather than where the artist is from and what the background of that artist's practice might be uh i wonder if there is a sort of response from like critics that might be somehow be sort of bothered by that. I don't know, Leanne. What, what so you're trying to say? So just I just yeah. understand mm. how you bridge this, so that you're saying if you work within a writer mm. to make an exhibition, the audience would respond to the exhibition rather than the writer. Perhaps I don't know. Or I mean, what what do you think? If you you sort of put things on into the public realm. Mm -hmm how it would, how, what, what the audience reaction would be. Yeah. So I mean, do you think people really sort of care if it's... I guess your question is really about how invested do you think the audience really is and whether, you, there, whether the work is coming from someone from a certain background or a certain discipline mm. or, right, or yeah. another. Right, yeah. Surely that also um, depends on what the output is. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Mm. At the end of Absolutely. the day, people are going to question it differently depending on what what they're seeing yeah, yeah sure um, yeah so there's this there's a sort of value in like the object or the thing or the experience that you're having that's external from who made it and what their background is I and what their practice I is i would say it depends probably on exactly how codified the art is or the kind of work is by its own discipline and so what sort of tools do you need to interpret it so i think um i'm working on an exhibition right now that does have um, historic design, it has contemporary kind of speculative design, and also art. And, um, and I think for us, the kind of challenges with doing that and bringing those things together, it has a lot to do with um, the kind of expectations of the institution and how the institution mm. itself wants to frame itself. Um, the VNA is a museum of art and design, and yet where does art come in and where, do, where can we not have art? And that's a question that the institution is constantly asking itself in, in, in an interesting and maybe sometimes limiting way. Um, the other thing is to do with the interpretation and how we can communicate about kind of a work of historic significance or a work of contemporary design in relation to that work of art. Mm. And then the other thing is, to, is, is absolutely to do with audiences and and whether it's um, for our audience, whether the story of the kind of the discipline of the kind of history of how the context of where, how the art is made um, is important, or whether it's the kind of idea itself of that it's trying to communicate that sure. is more important. Yeah. Um, mm. Charlotte. No, I was just thinking, but I guess in terms of like um, anything goes, I think it goes, but within a very uh, codified system mm -hmm. yeah i think like, it seems like the you know the, the sort of 20th century has been very much like about um individual artists like who have been then exploring different practices and bringing them together but uh, the name of the artists it, you know have become nearly like 
brands, people I think are very aware of like who does what you know like at the at the Tate there's these sort of big sellout shows and people go that anything goes within the context under the umbrella of that name but the name still has taken like a while to to mm. to, to build so I guess mm. um but I don't know it's, it seems to me that there is a lot of focus around around the brand of the artist today mm. sure okay so, so people are interested of where it comes from and who's been making it and how and stuff yeah, I agree, actually. people do sort of yeah. engage with that because it brings us on to Miley Cyrus, doesn't it? <laughs> that, because she's uh, <laughs> which I refuse to talk about. <laughs> You're refusing to talk about yeah, Miley Cyrus because I think it's so unnecessary to talk about, and by talking about it, we are actually giving it more weight than it. <laughs> so you don't think that her artwork's very good? It earns for. <laughs> so do you feel a bit uncomfortable about her being? considered a visual artist no i'm just uh finding the whole conversation uninteresting because it's like <laughs> of course there will be speculations there will be speculations about Miley cyrus or there was a speculation about somebody <coughs> else in the past mm. and i don't find it interesting to talk about and when you talk about these things you actually give themselves or assign themselves more significance than they are really mm. Mm. Well, i think all of this comes down to what charlotte was just saying this is a brand yeah. Mm. The only reason we're even talking about this is because it's Miley Cyrus. Sure. If it was somebody else, it probably wouldn't have even been a blip on the. Yeah. On the. On the I mean, it's know. sort of there was. It, 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 so it, for those of you who don't know, Miley Cyrus has been making like visual art in, and um, the head of the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA, very well respected guy, has compared her work to um, Mike Kelly, who's a, um, an, another LA-based artist. And um, it's upset people, uh, up artists, I think, probably more so. And I, was kind of, I am kind of interested in, maybe let's not talk about Miley Cyrus, but people's own idea of like the importance of that branding of those practices. I would say, um, I think it's really interesting exactly to look at kind of the, who sets the boundaries between disciplines? Why? Why is it? Why is it not just a body of work? It's it's a discipline. It's interdisciplinary. Who sets those boundaries and for what reasons? Mm. And often they have to do with commercial reasons. I mean, I guess also kind of museological kind of needs to kind of categorize and define um, kind of areas of the collection. But typically within the commercial sector, it has a lot to do with these kind of more. Yeah, because you sort of there's this, this the idea is that as an artist you make art without getting paid for it. You do it because you're gonna you're you're doing you're pursuing this sort of irrational thing, not with a name to like doing anything outside of the studio. What happen, happens to the work outside of the studio mm -hmm. is sort of different in terms of your intention for making that work in the mm -hmm. first place. But someone who is like say a fashion photographer is obviously being paid to shoot mm. that image so there's a, yeah. maybe there's a thing about intention yeah. somehow uh, I mean interestingly that kind of that is historic um, the kind of fashion photographer used to be seen as a sort of lesser form of photographer certainly kind of in the 50s and and so they they were seen as kind of um, a, cor a corruption of the kind of pure intentions of the photographer um, but now I think that's sort of shifted and I think that um, you know art artists are constantly working in kind of in this commercial capacity through publications through brands and so I think mm -hmm. uh, indeed the kind of barriers between kind of the seriousness of the kind of art historic and the kind of commercial have kind of collapsed a little bit and so yeah it's also a reflection of brands desires to tap into that world, you know, to associate themselves with these things, and right. uh, it's another form of. So there's a sort of grooviness associated with Absolutely. contemporary art that brands want to associate themselves with in some way. I think so. Yeah, yeah but mm. I think contemporary. Art, I mean, I really agree. Mm. The point is maybe not the Miley Cyrus and Jeffrey Deitch and like the other kind of patrons of art, but it's mm. about how one thing is branded as okay, this is a legitimate work or this is actually part of art. You might not think so, but it actually adds something to the pool of understanding the world around us through the lens of art. Let's say. 
So in that sense, it is interesting to question. But also, I think we are at a time where there is a um, emphasis, a kind of strong emphasis towards contemporary art, and there's a kind of a rise of patronage, and you know, a, but a multitude of collectors that are becoming more and more visible and actually also growing in numbers and quantity. And in that sense, it also kind of introduces a different stamina to the production of art as art by the artists, mm. by the galleries, by the collectors and by the art fairs and so on and so forth. So then maybe it is important to question what is it that we are looking at? Is it mm. kind of a part of an entertainment sector that is actually infiltrating into the domain of art or if it is something that is kind of has a meta value within itself that we can recognize from the frontiers of art as art. Mm. Mm. But it's quite funny because you were saying like this sort of monetary aspect to the creation of the work, but I mean traditionally even like historically there's been a lot of support of artists who were producing their art, whether it be galleries who would pay their artists a sort of weekly salary or um or you know, I don't know, Michelangelo or whatever, like who'd have like the big supports in a way. It's like I don't know if that would be the differentiation or if it would be more like that fashion photography, for example, is very much about selling a product mm. that's beyond itself and it's not like useless in itself. I guess uselessness is like a good, I don't know, um, I don't know, association with that, isn't it? Like this idea of like you can't brush your teeth with it or something, or you can't like <laughs> I don't know, it's really not utilizing. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so I mean, ma really maybe there's this sort of worthiness. There's a sort of worthiness vibe about um, intending to make an artwork over intending to. It is true. Do fashion photography or something? Maybe that's the sort of implication mm. i don't yeah. know doesn't it come from how the work originates i mean like yeah. you're saying if fashion photography is originating because of trying to sell a product or to market something and as opposed to something that's coming purely from a point of expression and creation mm. um, it's not to say that fashion photography isn't art and it doesn't have art within it but it doesn't mean that I guess it just comes down to yeah, what are the intentions? Where's the motivation? Where's the expression within that? Where's the the sort of the origination for that that piece of work coming from? And it's also true because also with the point that Liam was making, also that the institutions very much define also what is art and what is considered mm -hmm. art. So it's quite a crazy role that's attributed, isn't it? And I guess the idea of entertainment also is just because like today it's so accessible like the galleries opened up in the sense of like the internet mm. and like the visibility mm. for someone to show something is so much greater or like yeah i mean it seems like art in a way it's sort of constructed against the sort of ugliness of consumption and consumer mm. society and I th it's interesting i think through kind of changes in the way that we engage with information and and ideas and and um visual culture through kind of the internet and um has really kind of shifted that a little bit, and ha and how can how does art maintain that sort of um, criticality within this new environment? Mm. Is a, I think a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. I agree, mm. definitely, mm. because it's also like how do we define criticality too? Yeah, on that sense, like exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe Who sort decides? of that criticality <laughs> exists <laughs> because there because there is a boundary around what is definable as art. Yeah, but we've produced a uh, boundaries too. It's like also about the definition of art. The art doesn't have a definition, but by every artwork it gets defined. Mm. You know, and then so it can either expand or shrink, but like everything by every element or by every component of it, mm. it is, you know, it kind of gains a definition, a feature. I mean, as, as a curator, it's quite interesting. Um, thinking again historically, one of the, the kind of key people who pushed um, the kind of idea of fashion curation forward was Diana Vreeland. He was, of course, very famous as an editor of Harper's Bazaar and Vogue. And um, even when they did a retrospective on her at the Met in the 90s, um, just after her death, um, they kind of referred to her still, she wasn't a, yet a curator, she was still an editor. And, mm. um, and I think that's really interesting, this sort of kind of, uh, the kind of tension around um, 
the kind of commercial aspects of, of culture and this des desire to kind of remove ourselves from them, which, I mean, again, historically is interesting if you look at some, someone, something like the, the Bauhaus and they were really trying to collapse. I love them. They were trying to bring together <laughs> design and, and art and commerce and to kind of to create a better society. Sure, and in yeah. order to kind of do that, they needed to bring in design. They needed to bring in those more kind of useful utilitarian things and see if they could be elevated through the kind of criticality as well. And so I think this idea, idea of like disciplines being separate is not necessarily kind of historic always. I think it's mm. something that's really kind of increasingly kind of tried to emerge for at certain times in history and other times in history really collapses. And I think right now we're experiencing a time where it's kind of collapsing. Yeah, I agree. I mean, disciplines actually emerged after modernism mm -hmm. in a way that like, we needed to understand things in relation to the category that they are placed in. But mm -hmm. now what's happening with it is like we've kind of came to a dry point where it is not going any further. It's like maybe there is almost like a kind of invisible wall that we're pushing. So that's why I think it's become almost an urgency that for artists that it's not mm -hmm. only painting but it's actually also the music that kind of mm -hmm. or it's about recognizing that perhaps because what mm -hmm. you said in the beginning was so right I think the fact that we are as individuals are influenced by so many things around us so it's not only we don't have only one source that we always feed ourselves from and I feel like within the currency of our times what's happening is maybe perhaps we're unleashing those relations, unleashing those influences and, and kind of recognizing them or accepting them mm. and, and giving them a place in our body of practice. It, it's also like a reflection mm. of how you experience the world today, I think. It's like, you know, you're not really just getting your newspaper and getting one source of information. You're like bombarded with like mm. stuff everywhere. That's true. And like go to a supermarket, there's like so much stuff. Like everything is like so the same. It would be very... I mean, maybe it's difficult to reflect our time through uh, through something that would be very. So but can't yeah. Do. So maybe with those institutions and with curators, then maybe that's that's sort of shifting the hierarchy a bit. So that the curators are then collecting or collating this information, and so art isn't really about the kind of what happens in terms of production, but it's what happens in terms of display. Do you know what I mean? So there's yeah. like, so it's about like when you're looking at something, it's about what the context it is, what yeah. you're what you're looking at it in. And then if that's the case, then it's really the it's not really the artists that have any control over that. It's more people that run those institutions and mm. curators. Perhaps. <laughs> 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 yeah, let's have the artist perspective. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, absolutely right. I mean, at the end of the day, you're you're putting that in. You're almost giving that job to define what's what's considered art to that person, mm. and uh, so much of it is subjective that you know. I think uh, it, it, those opinions can vary so wildly. Like all the controversy around, um, you know, this this thing with Miley Cyrus, not to bring her up again, but it, you know, this guy's <laughs> opinion is that she should be considered this way, mm. and that upsets everybody else, and that's his opinion. Mm. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. But like, if the opinion becomes too much of a, of a spectacle, then there is the there's another thing there, you know, so that we actually start seeing or perceiving things from people that actually have a weight in in that kind of scene. Mm -hmm. And I think like every exhibition is a recontextualization of the artwork. So I think artwork doesn't have one meaning or one dimension. It has m multiple dimensions and with it, every exhibition, let it be a group show or a solo show, it is recontextualized. So, and then of course that recontextualization is channeled through the curator or the director or the you know, organizer, whoever has taken the responsibility of assembling it in a display. I think as uh, coming from design a little bit more, I think one of the things that I find really interesting is the kind of um, the kind of the kind of control. I, I guess the role of taste in all of this, mm -hmm. and how are we are we there to kind of 
um, objectively interpret um, what's happening? Are we there to objectively interpret the past? Or are we there to say what's good, what's nice, what's positively pleasing, what we should be kind of valuing? And I think, um, I, I, you know, as a curator, I feel it's my duty to be s uh, somewhat objective about the kind of material that I'm choosing and how I'm trying choosing to interpret it. Um, but it is interesting how often it does slip into the, the discourse and into the decision making, um, particularly when you start kind of working with a kind of broader team. Um, a, a lot of things do seem to be dictated by taste, and I think that's often really quite limiting. Mm. And also, of course, the need to ca the need to categorize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wonder if we should ask if anyone's got any questions at this stage. Does anyone want to chip in? Is there any, any questions? Yes. Yeah, please. Maybe picking up on the, uh, the point about unleashing just a wide range of influences. I think that came up in a couple of different places. I'd be fascinated in hear about some of the personal experience of working across disciplines. It strikes me that one of the roles of art is to open perception. The artist allows us to see things that we would not have seen otherwise. And you were touching on some of these things. That's what makes it maybe a bit different from commercial. But at the same time, I think all these things are art. It's about communication, opening perception. Now I understand a piece of clothing I didn't understand before. You call it advertising. But the work here opens my eyes to see some things about landscape and light differently, et cetera, and history. And um, anyways, but my curious, my, my question right now is about getting into the practice now. You're working with somebody who's maybe coming from a quite different perspective. That's quite powerful now, because they're bringing in a fresh perspective. They see things differently than I do mm -hmm. as an artist. You do as an artist. So I'd like to talk, hear you maybe talk a bit about what's that dynamic like? What do you discover in that kind of a partnership and that interdisciplinary uh, collaboration? Is that aimed at me, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it's, I guess it's, uh, I don't come to the work thinking about it that way, so it's hard to, I think, answer your question specifically, but um, I'm so used to pulling from so many different fields and areas, and it's, it's what inspires you, it's what, uh, you know, when you're looking to try and express something or create something, visually that that is going to communicate what it is that you're trying to say and and uh not not really thinking about that this is cross disciplinary or transdisciplinary because that actually is it's just a natural thing and i think it is more and more so for newer generations is that this the approach of drawing upon different areas of expertise is actually just part of the way people work now and you aren't going into it consciously thinking that I'm going to intentionally try to pull these two things together or these, these three things together to make something new. It's really, it's just part of the process. Exactly. I'd be curious on Gary, like, I mean, you had your partnership, your partnership in your work up here. Mm -hmm. I, more the reality of you're now sitting down with somebody and you have to film something. There's a lot of decisions, different opinions, and probably ideas. Yeah. That's what I'd be interested in because I mean that happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But in your perspective, or in your experience, maybe of doing these, you know, fascinating works, something new has been created that we haven't seen before. I'm curious about I think, I mean, what that, was difficult or, yeah, or yeah, yeah. therefore it, helpful <laughs> when suddenly you realize that he, he said something I never thought about or whatever. Yeah. What's really fascinating about that is that those disagreements, because they obviously, you know, they happen, of course. You've got creative opinions, and, and, but that's where the interesting things happen is because, you know, wanna, you know, you have these established ways of approaching how you're going to photograph something and then you have somebody else who really v knows very little about photography but suggest something that you hadn't thought of because you're thinking about it in the context of how photography works. And, and I, for me, that's why I talk about it, it really is rooted in collaboration is because that's where the interesting things happen. You bring people into it thinking about things, thinking about a, a field that they aren't necessarily familiar with, but they're bringing their way of thinking about it to that. And that's what unleashes something interesting. Can, can you give one example from... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, you know, alongside the the images that were were captured, we um, we were also looking for a way to capture this and capture the actual act of of, of painting, of revealing these images across the landscape. And and um, you know, 
I had a very sort of perceived notion about how you could capture that with a film camera. Um, and Aaron had a very, very different idea that, you know, really we could just kind of sequence these frames, layer them on, on top of each other. I mean, we ended up with unbelievable amounts of data because of it, but it worked, you know, and he was right, but it took that kind of combination of, you know, you have to think about this um, from the perspective of how these things work, how you can expose a scene, how you can uh, put motion back together. And, 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 and then combine that with this sort of ideal of, well, you know, we want to sort of reveal that action, but this is a, a, a moment, you know. To, to stand and watch these happening is, is, is a very strange experience because you are, you're just seeing this one single line of light moving across the landscape, and it, it's about revealing something that the human eye can't see. It's about seeing something that... Um, yeah, the, revealing something that's hidden. You know, the, you're standing here and it's pitch black, but then when you open the lens for an extended period of time, it reveals something new. You see the world in a different way, and that's what's interesting about it. Yeah. Well, yeah, ex I mean, yeah, when you see that first, uh, you know, the, the beauty of digital technology is that you can see those results immediately. When you see that first. Um, that first piece captured, yeah, it is, it's very exciting because until you're actually there and you paint this, then you actually don't know what it's going to look like exactly. So that's uh, uh, where the excitement comes from. Yeah. Uh, so which one's more exciting? Um, <laughs> where, does, <laughs> where does the value, uh, where, what do you value more? Which discipline, I guess, to both of you? I mean, it's quite clear from both of your work that you draw influences from both your other careers but which one <laughs> like excites you most? what do you prefer to do uh, is that the question yeah sort of yeah i guess i again i don't i try not to think about it in a way that that they're separated for me this is just and i feel like I, this is for me at least present in the work that i do is that i'm i i try to approach it not thinking about this is Photography, this is film, this is interactive, this is digital, because w they all use different things and they all bring those things together in unique ways. And I think if you start thinking about it and, and, and you put those boundaries on it, then you're kind of already doing what someone else is going to try to do, but you sort of lock yourself into a way of thinking that... Um, perhaps isn't helpful, but I don't know, maybe you can... No, it's true, but it's also amazing to see um, how, obviously, you can exp explore, like, a very specific thing. For example, in photography, like, I find it really amazing the way you can uh, capture a visual of time passing by, which is obviously what you're also working with, and, um, which you can't get in any other medium, and so there's something amazing about it. It's like you, you could do a feature film, you know condensed in one image in a way and it would just be like a multiple of like these abstracts of like amazing late and there's something incredible about being able to hold the passing of time in like one image so it's just like it's but it does work with the similar things I guess of like constructive well, for me constructing a narrative and very much like playing with the references of of storytelling and like the the symbolisms of like uh, I guess uh, I don't know uh, the way our mind always builds it into stories, but um, but yeah, photography I just think is amazing because of that way it can specifically capture time and like collapse it. It's so beautiful, <laughs> so amazing to play with. Um, it's more relating to boundaries, uh, what you were talking about before, and I was just wondering that hasn't it been boundaries that actually have helped artists? push further and get further along and then also aren't we now even though we're saying that there are no boundaries aren't we trying to find boundaries so that we have something to push <laughs> and that's that's mm. kind of my question really. yeah it's an interesting point if you didn't have a boundary you wouldn't have something to push against so mm. yeah and that um. then in my mind maybe also relates to what we were talking about earlier with curating that if there is nothing to push isn't it almost that you could 
put on anything and it would almost be considered art just because the audience is already expecting that art mm -hmm. can be anything. So Wh that kind why of did you think I said there's nothing to push? No, but no, but I was just wondering. Uh, okay, I don't think there's nothing to push. There's a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. And there's still a lot to explore and try out. So then maybe this idea of anything goes isn't really anything goes. No, never anything went, actually. Mm. You know, <laughs> even when Boy said, you know, ev or in a, yeah, every, every, event, every person is an artist, or everyone, everybody's an artist, or when Andy Warhol said, you know, in the future, everybody will be, you know, famous for 15 minutes. Uh, they are actually speculative statements, but it were nev they were never, how can I say, premises that w would you know, lead to truth. Mm. So. <laughs> so as a curator, uh, what stimulates you uh, to do one thing? There, there has to be some financial uh, incentive there has to be some fashion incentive for this particular artist or designer who comes forward at that particular time. You have the politics as well. Um, mm. At the moment, we have the British Museum director defending his, uh, his uh, promoting the, you know, taking the, the uh, piece of weeks. Yes. Yep, yep. Mm. Um, so you're, you're under a lot of pressure. Um, and also, you have to get uh, people into uh, the galleries, into the museums, and you have to persuade people that your judgment, rather than your opinion, mm -hmm. it has to be an informed judgment, mm -hmm. does it not? How, how do you, how, this is a minefield, is it not? I mean, I'm an artist, so for me it's easy, yeah. I, just, I, just, uh, I just do. Uh, right. But uh, you, do the, you do the other side of it. Would you, you would you say that, I mean, every exhibition is a little different and it is it depends on the context as well. Um, sometimes it, it I, I've been really lucky to, uh, we worked in a really experimental space. Who makes the decision? It's you make the decision. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not alone, <laughs> never alone. I mean, it's always a process, it's always a dialogue, isn't it? And it's always in relation to an audience. It's always in relation to sort of what's happening specifically in a subject that could could be looked at a little bit further. Um, yeah. And it's always in relationships, it's always an extension of your um, professional relationships as well. I mean, I'm an independent curator, so I've been independent the last 10 years. I've worked with various institutions and I did shows. Uh, it's been, it's always a collaboration, but it wasn't like, um, um, I mean, I think I was lucky to be free in whatever I've been doing. And also with FIG2 program, I'm really free. I can introduce any artist I want to work with. And I don't have any kind of board or a committee that actually evaluates what I do. And I think that's a very luxurious thing. Almost allows me to be like an artist, although I know deep down that I'm not one. So there's an element of trust in your, your position. I think so. But also with the other people, uh, that, uh, the, the galleries or the um, museums. So you're the one in the middle. Is that right? You're representing the artist or the uh, I am. Um, I'm working in the art. And of course, I value artists and artistic input the most. But also, it's about instituting the social imaginary. And you do it through making an uh, independent exhibition, or you do it through running a very large scale institution. But it's all about instituting the social imaginary. What are the radical imaginations of the artists today, or writers, designers today? Mm -hmm. And how do you bring it to a ground where it can meet different minds, different practices. And also like um, what you said about like art allows us to look at things differently. Recently there was an interview with David Hockney and he also says that as well, that people don't look that much. So artists actually introduce ways in which the way we look and perceive the world around us, understand the world around us is shifted through the encounter 
but the work of art. And I would also say um, that there are different ways of curating. So exactly. sometimes the curation is really about the artist's message and trying to kind of um, interpret that and communicate their ideas. Other times it's um, a more conceptual show where the act of curating is actually forming the concepts. Um, and, and you're using the work to kind of tell, you, tell your story. And um, so, there, I mean, there are so many different approaches and so many different kind of positions, yeah, positions to take. Yeah. And um, I've taken many different positions within kind of my short career. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, I think it's always evolving. Fantastic. Does anyone have anything else they want to add? Of course you can, yeah. It's really just to make a statement that's mm. perhaps in confirmation of, of interdisciplinary art, uh, having just come from an exhibition, which I think is part of that creative process. It's the Grayson Perry at uh, the National Portrait Gallery. And I don't know which came first, whether it was the curators asking Grayson to produce the work in conjunction with the television programmes or the television programmes that then, you know, sort of approached him. But it was just, I thought it was incredibly successful in, in, in all formats, both the television programmes and I've, the works of art I've just seen. So I suppose it's just a yeah. clap in hands or confirmation. <laughs> <but> I think <laughs> that works. <He's> amazing. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, all right, well, thanks everyone for coming. <coughs> thanks so much for Green to take part. Uh, I don't know what we resolved, but it was a bit of a journey. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you, maybe you've had a chance to think about things slightly differently. Um, and uh, yeah, so thanks again for coming. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.